This is our grand finale. Um, it has promised a discussion of ancient truth using the band video I understand I'm coming from um, as a point of energy. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to play the video, then we're going to cut to an interview with the uh, former who actually directed and edited the video. Uh, this person was news to me. I only discovered, um, well, I, I wrote a blog for Forty Year about about uh, an op ed um, about this album, what I had done. So I discovered that very little material about the Prophet of the City is actually on YouTube. I had the video and I copied, uh, I think, the masters about 20 years ago, copied them, had them digitized more very recently, and then decided, well, nobody's going to actually put this up. It has historical value. People should be sharing this. I uploaded it up to YouTube, wrote an offering about it for 40 and static flow. You know, I didn't grew this person emails me to say, I got, got, got the shock of my life, I went to the Daily Guardian, Sport Feeder, read this article, saw the video, I made it. This is the story <laughs> we should look up. So that's the story. Then you cut to an interview with Shaheen. Actually, it's Shaheen and Lady Lee, but for the interest of time, I cut D out, and D's here so he can speak for himself in person. So without further ado, I think we should cut to the video to give you a bit of context if you haven't seen it already. This is a song I'd like to dedicate to Nelson Mandela. I'd like to dedicate this one to Oliver Tambo, Chris Hani, the one and only Steve Biko, all those people who are with us in the struggle, especially all the people back home, the teachers, fighting for an education for our people. So here we go. The story is not for me Why should I fight for a country's glory When it ignores me Beside the townships already a war zone So I complain all moan Cause your home is not much worse than your neighbors Cause everyone's looking for handouts and favors And it's not a funny sight Cause money's tight A whole factory got laid off the other night Now unemployment makes me sell Boy with the boys and girls in your neighborhood But who's gonna pay for food? But the rich will blame the poor for the fate of the township. A charity I'm not down with. So don't look to the ones who put you there in the first place. When you're restless on Thursdays, a weekend is the worst case. Everybody's drinking and playing game. But I guess this pain led to this kind of mind state. And the crime rate increases. Now tomorrow became a blind day. Voices of the deprived children. 
And I came back when the NC was unbanned and with the intention of helping prepare for elections. So I was based at Shell House under Brawali Sorority and we had a very difficult agenda which is hard to actually grasp in this day of you know, uh, high media, almost constant stream of media of different flavors that people can choose. We came into an environment where we were a government in waiting in one office block with no access to the media. In fact, the opposite with a media that was intent on suppressing our message. So, um, when Lance approached me, obviously I had to run it past the channels because they didn't have any budget. I think they had like 2,000 rand or something like that. And um, I got the go ahead to use the resources that we had to make this video. And at the time, I mean, um, what people don't realize is the context that when you walked into the SAPC, there were armed guards. That when you walked into an edit suite, there were guys, armed guards, standing off it at the door, that the, everybody knew the suites were all bugged, you know, that was the, the context that you were in, and um, we had no access to any of the facilities without permissions and paperwork and these kinds of things, and we had no access to the archives. So for me, to use archive footage in that climate was a statement in itself, because you know, what's the point of being unbanned if I can't show you Sharpful, right? So the only way I could show that imagery was to do it subversively. So, um, at the time, Eddie and Barlow, who had been in the NC Underground Film Unit, he had formed the first black-owned production company. There I was, you know, the one white girl was, was always my like thing. There I was, the one whitey in the black production company. <laughs> and the cultural desk or whatever, and more militant than anybody. This was always the problem. But anyway, I got Eddie, with some of Wally's help, to agree to produce this bloody video. So it involved like a whole lot of um, underground grapevine channel to get that footage out of that archive and into my hands. So we had a whole system that involved the SABC canteen where we would go into the canteen, they would have put in a like innocuous request for, I don't know, like CNN footage on spaceships or whatever. We'd filled out the requisitions, we'd hand it to our guy and he of course would bring me back Steve Biko whatever else I wanted. Anyway, this went on for about three weeks. I sat, I couldn't sit and cut that video during working hours, right? Because you had like ears everywhere. You had people everywhere. They would like come in, just oh, open your door, listen to what you're cutting. No, I wouldn't have even seen the light of day. So um, I would sit from like six in the evening till six the next morning, or that kind of shift to cut the bloody thing and I liked it rough like I liked the rough cut that I'd made and wanted to polish but there were certain things that I wanted to do that footage that at that time you couldn't do in a regular edit suite you needed like the first computerized suite which at the time in the SABC was called Henry and one of my good friends Michael Becker was the main editor of Henry so a little bit of arm twisting, there we sat, 3 o'clock in the morning, again, polishing the POC video. 
And at that time, I think Henry was like 5,000 rand an hour or something like that, which was a huge amount of money at the time. And the irony was that at a similar time, I was about to make Johannes Karkul's video, but I spoke no Afrikaans at all. And there I was doing POCs and Johannes's and not really understanding the language, but understanding the essence, so to speak. So we polished POC and it had to go to a final mix. And I tried very hard to get the sound dude that I thought was the least, you know, racist, the least inflammable to book for that final mix. And um, he was sick of the day, or I can't remember what happened, but I walked into the sound suite, the guy stuck the tape in, we started the first verse, he threw his hands up and said, I refuse to cut this. I refuse to mix this. I won't go into the expletives that he used in Afrikaans, <laughs> but just to say that he refused to do the mix. So Eddie had to pull a few strings. We actually did the sound mix outside of the SABC. We had to pay with our own money. We got followed by guards to our cars with our tape boxes. They were searched. I mean, from that moment on, every time we walked into the building, it was an ongoing search. Not to mention that we had people outside our houses, but I think we always had that because we were working at Shaw House. So, concert was linked. <laughs> anyway, now we had our little prize. The guys loved it. Wally loved it. And we had to think about how we were going to get this on air. Because what people don't understand is the media of the country was entirely state run. So, where am I going to show you this stuff? Okay, so the guys wrote great tracks. Okay, so I made a great video about marching to Pretoria with MK. But, where am I going to show this thing? And there, the kind of underground network against it in. Before I knew it, Eddie, one morning I remember waking up and there was Good Morning South Africa or something. I can't remember what it was called. Was it that? Good Morning South Africa? I know that I saw it on the Toyota Top 20. Yes, That's that was Lawrence. But yeah. first, it went out on breakfast tea. Good grief. There, over their cornflakes, at 7.30 in the morning was everybody watching understand where I'm coming from, right? Because one of the guys had slipped it into the playlist. When it came to Lawrence, Lawrence and I were like very, very close friends. So, you know, that was easy, even though he risked his job in doing that. But I think it's not so much that as youth we were fearless as much as we were ready to stand up, you know, that's what you were measured by, you were talking about tape measures. In that time, for us, as part of the movement, we were measured by being willing to stand up. No one was measuring you sitting down and crumpled. When we actually recorded the album, we found out that the reason for Bob Studios to be built was part of the Baputatswana's government to kind of, as part of a broader publicity, marketing kind of thing, they wanted to present Baputatswana as a sovereign state, distant from South Africa, and so they built the best studio in the southern hemisphere and, and the idea was to attract the Michael Jacksons and whatever to record, you know, in, in, in the heartbeat of Africa, you know, that kind of, you know, so this kind of curio shop thingy where it's like, you know, don't look for creativity in the hustle bustle of New York and London, you know what I mean, you want to come to home of the drum, you know, all of those kind of curio shop colonial 
kind of shit. They tried to try to attract all the big artists, and they felt that if they recorded there, uh, because they couldn't perform in South Africa, you know what I mean, due to the the BDS uh, campaign there, that that would help boost Paputa Tswana's reputation on the world stage and all of that. So we heard about this while we were recording. And that made it to the lyrics, right? Because Luca, Lucas Mangope was the kind of so cool. head of phony state. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it was the class prefect. Um, and so... <laughs> Uh, yeah, class prefect, and race. Um, and so the gedachte there was, in one of our lines we were like, fuck Mangopi even if we record here, you know, that type of, that type of thing. And the guy who ran the studio at the time, like he was fuming. He called the two of us into a meeting, this long ass table with all our masters there, the master debts. And fortunately we made backups. Uh, like second generation backups of all the mixes and so Ramon managed to get hold of the box remember Ramon managed to get hold of the box with the the the, the backup mixes because they held the the masters back and so Ramon managed to grab the Bavirgen while they were threatening us with stuff of the say uh, what, what was the one thing he raised us B- bite the hand that feeds you yeah. why do you bite the hand that feeds you use our studio we cook, uh, gear we give the studio uh, to you to use so so basically mango groove us and i think it was timela at the time because ray Piri was there right yeah uh, 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 um, what kind of you we could have access to the studio um, at like a crazy discounted rate to a to test out the studios and also to 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 basically use the music that come out of that to kind of entice the quality of the mixes and stuff like that to entice other people to record there as well. So we were kind of like the experimental part of an experimental group. Anyway, so he was like gave the studio space to you for almost next to nothing and blah, 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 blah. Like, how do you explain that to yourself? How do you live with yourself? And what was the gedacht we said? In the same way Biko and Mandela does when they went to university. <laughs> To get that information <laughs> to blip in the system. We were like, yeah. and you the bra was angry. Yeah, yeah our was Yo. Like, okay, this is a, bra, a white Brahmin, you know, who's running the studio. He's just trying to cover his ass. Yeah. You know, yeah. because he's bang with Mangopi or somebody, you know, the stuff that we say. They may be going to stay in a couple of, <laughs> where, uh, you know, the African man's cup in the air, raise hell with his bra. So he was right. like, obviously trying to protect his job. And just to cover his own ass as well. And I think, from what I recall now, I, I, it's kind of vague, but I think the reason, because we basically spat with the with the the backup masters, right? Because uh, we remember we rushed out of that gedachte just to get to the border. We were like, come on, <laughs> to get to the border of so-called South Africa, so they couldn't call in anyone. And I think they didn't make a whole fuss about that because they didn't want that kind of negative publicity. Do you know what I mean? To kind of go after us legally or something. I think that's that's kind of what I recall. But but so we felt at that time when the album was released and everything, like okay, now we won this bewegen. But we really underestimated the relationship between the state and corporations, because what happened was like 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 they said. We, every single major festival we were booked on, we were cancelled. It was, um, Mitchell Splain's Musica had like, what, five copies yeah. of, of Age of Truth and like, a hundred copies of Guns N' Roses or something like that. Like, you couldn't find it in stores really, and we were, it was very difficult to make a living then as Prophets of the City after that album came out because those relationships were very, very, very tight, and it was like, okay, you're gonna dial out that? Why? Snipe die gedachte. So we were, in some ways, forced to go outside of the country. And I mean, I'm not saying that we wanted to be provincial or anything like that. Like, you want to explore the world, but you at least wanted to explore the world in your own terms. And, 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 and we made music for the Mitchell's Plains and the Googs, you know, and the Lavendales and the Langas and stuff like that. And to not to have that kind of engagement or to have that 
music and access to our brothers and sisters it was it was blind painful in very many ways you know some of us have gotten a lot of flack by negating and rejecting coloredness mm. you know what i mean and embracing blackness in the way that we did that it was like yo you don't have any colored groups you have just like this one colored group that people identify with and like yeah. are you ours like and now you like voice like no color like you know what i mean and there was a a kind of militancy in the way that we rejected coloredness that at times was very clumsy in the way that in the same way that you know like when you get like uh, um some lefties you know that are there are like lumming with Marx and Vitti but honestly and then they treat other people that might not have raised those things almost like yeah you don't know shit <laughs> you know that kind of a bit like they were born they came out <laughs> means of production or whatever and not realizing that y- you have this racial category you know there was in many ways hammered into people do you know what I mean you're talking about parts of history way the conditions under which identities were created was extremely extremely brutal and the options people had to counter that were very zaltis or dalama just a very quick comment um and this really draw to how the issue man he is black he is colored and blackness then becomes what we used to say the black liberation movement a state of mind that your ancestry that your color and it's really drawn to how that being played out over here I got a question for um, for the artist in thinking about this um, ready deed specifically so in hip hop in the states at that time blackness was so front and center and black identity was everything you know that almost every song that you heard even if it was about the club or party you had a verse that was about blackness or Africa or something right it was about being black and And so I wonder, when we talk about hip-hop moving all around the world, one thing that I notice and that scholars write about is the shifting, the way local paradigms of race and constructions of race and systems of race get shifted through ideologies of race that move in through uh, rap music, you know, or hip-hop culture. So in what ways were you thinking about, I mean, were you thinking about, oh, the U.S. has a different... system of racial classification than ours, but let us adopt and adapt blackness to our circumstance, or what was the process? Like, were you thinking about that specifically, or? Yeah, um, thank you for that. Um, I was uh, sort of our connection with, with um, hip-hop as a culture. We, we're sort of from the first generation of hip-hop heads in South Africa, if you want to call it that. So we obviously had quite a deep connection to the likes of Kuna, Africa Mombata, Africa Islam, and um, those types of personalities using hip-hop as a medium to broke a piece between gangs, and that's how the birth of the Zulu nation um, sort of came together. And I think that was probably our interpretation of hip-hop's first entry point into the consciousness realm. And from that, we then... learn about the Black Panthers, the Five Percenters in New York, as well as the, uh, the Nation of Islam as well. And then um, there's various other groups through Hip Hop that uh, were delivering very strong sort of, if you want to call it, um, Black Conscious or Proud to be Black messages. And of course, Canada's one with the stable of Hip Hop and the Stop the Violence movement. We could relate to all of those things. And at one stage, we were so deep into what was coming from the U.S. and when hip-hop started to get into the black conscious phase, we were taking a very deep look at ourselves because at one stage, we were trying to emulate what was coming from the U.S. 
And at this point in time, it was so serious. I thought, well, if the brothers and sisters in the U.S. are all sporting these African medallions and they're wearing the dashikis and, you know, all those type of images and messages are coming through, uh, well, we should actually be taking um, more, I just said, we, we should be taking note of what's taking place right on the doorstep, but we are African. You know, so we are being celebrated abroad as well. And I think that was the turning point for us. And with um, the country slowly going through this transition, and with the turmoil, the harassment, the flak, um, the type of imagery, bombs going off, people being assassinated, you know, that even drew us closer to, if you want to call it, becoming more conscious and aware. So you start reading the literature, you start coming across um, Marcus Garvey, you start reading um, Steve Biko, you know, guys are putting literature from all over these discussion groups. We had little um, uh, lecture sessions where there's like four, five, up to ten of us sitting in my mom's living room on a weekly basis just trying to get ourselves educated because, as we said in the video, we didn't, you can't expect that type of education um, behind the school benches, that was non existent. You know, the type of things that we were taught. The messages that were that we were fed is to think of us as being inferior because all the images was white. It's the white God, the white Jesus, as Boot and Sarki, Mark and Kathy. Those were the type of stories that we grew up with from uh, kindergarten, if you want to call it that. You know, if, um, and the level of demoralization. If I think about it, it's still beyond belief that human beings could actually do that to other people, you know. The way that they, they, they segregated us, it's right through from your hair texture, the size of your lips, your skin color. You had to go there and they measure your lips. They would measure and roll the fingers and put pencils through your hair to establish whether you're African, whether you're colored, whether you're Malay, there's those types of things. And then it's stamped in your pass uh, and your, your ID documents. And you needed a pass to go from one area to the other area. So growing up as a, as a young boy, not aware of these things, and all of a sudden, it's almost like an overnight switch. A switch went on, it's just like overnight, oh my Lord, looks, look what's happened to us. You know, we really, really need to deal with this issue point blank because it was almost like the apartheid government put a state of emergency in place. We also felt that we needed to counter that with our interpretation of the state of emergency to counter that as well. And I guess thinking back and looking at the images, that's probably what that was in, in one sense. Can I just explain very quickly? Uh, Dee mentioned Putin Saki and Kathy and Mark. For those of you who don't know, was South African. Uh, Kathy and Mark was a, a leader. If you were sub A, the equivalent of gay ones. If you were sub A, in the English class, you get the Kathy and Mark leader. And of course, for Afrikaans, put Sarkin and Boot. Sarkin and Boot, you know, brother and sister. Um, Sarkin is the, uh, what do you call it? Fertlainen. What is Fertlainen in, in English? The, uh, I don't want to go there. I don't want to pay attention. Sarah, basically. Little, little Sarah. Little Sarah. I can't believe I can't translate something from Afghans into English. I used to be Afghan speaking. So, I'm not even so much. Now I'm also theory speaking. Theory speaks me. So, the point I'm making is these leaders, the Afghan leaders, the Kut and Saki, were the characters were white, the family was white, it was an heterosexual nuclear family, even though black people in the language. So, if you were Sub A coming into this, uh, imagining you know, coming to literacy, becoming literate, learning to read, you had to imagine these white kids, these white protagonists, Afrikaner protagonists. If you were in the English class, Kathy and Mark, you had to ima imagine a white American middle class family, because that's what Kathy and Mark was, white American, right? Um, heteronormative, very specific, all that stuff. So that's sort of socialization, that's, that's, what, you're, that's what you're talking about. So, um, for me specifically, and I think Dee as well, we're about the same age, uh, you'd have come out of 76 in the townships into schools, learning about Kathy and Mark or Wood and Saki. Right? 
right? Having just gone through 76 and see that kind of mentality. The first white people you encounter are in boots with rifles, right? And then you get Kathy and Mark in the sort of contradictions, right? So that's one part of it. What I also want to point to is, I think for D, I think people's experience will, experiences will differ. Uh, for D, am I correct in saying that conscientization happens through him, but the exposure to people like Shaheen was already down that road? Yes, that's yeah. correct. So if someone like Shaheen, Shaheen was a class clown, co-opted into the students' representative council, I believe, mean, right? So from being like, what, do you think you're so funny? Uh, why did you serve in the SRC and get involved, right? Did you mind me at And he was like, all right, I will, and I'll make you pay for it, right? So obviously he sees the opportunity for using hip hop. Already his father was of a generation of jazz musicians who come out of a sort of black consciousness era, right? And what was jazz doing? Jazz was defying uh, colonial segregation, racial segregation. So places like District Six and Safari Club were places they were melting pots. People would come there for the music, and there are people of all races and classes. So the front did not like this at all. So far, I had to be broken down, it became tired, three off, right? Tired, tired of what? We kicked your ass, that's what white supremacy is, right? Tired. That's when it becomes segregated. If one goes onto the locations, white folk, he was about to off. Uh, there's a story of a, a journalist who had an affair, a drug journalist, with, 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 with the white woman. And I think she ended up in Australia or something like that, that they were just completely vilified. Same thing happens in District 6. The place gets broken down, the musicians, the artists who come from, from those spaces, they all get sick off and dispersed. My great aunt was one of these people who sort of uh, drew a diverse people to her and was one of the sort of key hands of District 6 campaigners. And her place <coughs> home was one of the last ones that we launched. She ended up in Giants, basically, um, in a council flat. That's where she died. So that's sort of narrative. So the jazz generation was already embracing DC, it was already mobilizing. It was a site of resistance. And then, you know, that's DC Arifti's generation. And then his son, Shaheen Arifti, becomes a founding member of Prophet. So there's already this sort of continuity. It's just generations coming in at different levels, setting things off. Um, and as I suggested in you know, one of the earlier lectures, what had happened before Prophets existed, or Black Laws existed, there was some Dede Dikeni, there was the Sehon of the King. There were a lot of other poets, uh, playwrights, um, novelists, Wally Sarotti, you Wally Sarotti who, who gets referenced in, in one of the early interviews, you know, doing great poetry uh, to, um, to Eddie Burton's blood, one of, you know, one, probably one of the most phenomenal novels uh, to come out of this country, totally underrated. Um, so there's this sort of history. It's not as if my people discovered hip hop and it set it off. And we were inspired by these Americans. And, you know, American hip hop can save us. You know, Kanye, come and save me. You know, <laughs> um, with your JSX. Right? That's not what happened. It's just a bunch of people seeing the opportunity, recognizing the resonance. And, you know, culture is a big career you draw on the means of hand. So jazz musicians did that. Ironically, if you look at the work of Dave Copland and Brian Alvin, you'll see that American, African-American jazz musicians look to Africa for inspiration. And it was a two-way thing. So the, the call chains and the biggest of the world, it was a two-way thing already that was going on. And part of that was an ideological orientation, an assertion of blackness, which is ideological, not founded in biological essentials notions of identity, which is what I think you are getting at. Yeah. I really like that, that last point you were making. It helped me sort of think about something else that I want to maybe explore a little bit more that I've been thinking about, because I've written some stuff on the relationship between Islam and hip-hop culture. And I, I think it's interesting. I don't know, of course, all the stuff that's out there that's written about um, Cape Tony and South African hip-hop, but it seems to me like a lot of the connection, we talk about blackness and, and race a lot, but a lot of the connection was also Islam in that moment, in that particular moment. And I, I, I'm a little bit surprised by almost how dominant Islam was in the sort of early hip hop you know, community here. Of course, the same thing was in the United States where 
so much of the hip hop was, you know, Islamic oriented. It, it varies communities, as already Dee mentioned. Um, but we always talk about the race and the race connections, and I wonder about what were the sort of religious connections or spiritual connections, because there's there's a very spiritual movement at the core of blackness and black consciousness for African Americans. Like it's not just a political movement or whatever. Like for people involved, there's also a spiritual movement. And so I wonder the residents, Adam, you mentioned the residences, and so I wonder what residences were also seen in that way now. That's a big question. And yeah. Yeah, I have to answer that. That um that that's quite a big question is going to take um, quite a bit of assistance. But just from my, my perspective, I have embraced Islam because of the consciousness that came through hip hop. And the reason why I did that is also learning a little bit more about violence in terms of where, if you want to call it, um, my family and my ancestors come from as well. Although we've got this European African connection, we also have connections that go as far back as Java. If you look at the East, if you look at India, you look at all those places. And because of the Dutch East India Company, um, that was one of the companies, if I'm, I stand to be corrected, but they obviously had certain roots that they dominated, spice roots and so forth. Uh, Cape Town was one of the stopping points. And they would bring in quite a lot of slaves from abroad. And it was a lot of Muslim slaves that came to settle in Cape Town, as well as slaves coming from elsewhere in Africa as well. And um, I thought it was very interesting that I have Muslim family members and Christian family members. And I was a little bit confused about everything. My dad was Muslim, converted to Christianity. My sister's Muslim. So it's all these things taking place and just learning a little bit more about that. And my personality and character at the time, um, I felt I was, I couldn't, I couldn't, um, in layman's terms, I couldn't find my bearings within Christianity, kind of learning about its history and how it was enforced upon our people. And if you trace it back to the days of slavery, you know, there were certain, there, there certain stories that if you wanted your freedom, you had to become Christian and you had to buy yourself out of slavery as well. So to a certain degree it was a huge um, uh, you, you, you couldn't budge. That was it. And also kind of learning a little bit about the links when it comes to the Muslims joining forces with the local or should I say the indigenous Khoi people of Southern Africa as well. They formed various um, movements and militias to come to what was happening as well. And that's a lot of information and a lot of history that's not freely available, unfortunately. You know, you got to go to a mosque, you got to sit with the elder or dig deep. So for our general, if you want to call it the general um, community, unfortunately, you know, that, that information, that, that, that's not circulating unless you come to, you know, these types of environments as well to, to come and learn a little bit more about that. But uh, for me, once again, I felt it made sense because I needed to understand my history a little bit more, and knowing my ancestry came from the from um, from the east, you know, ten to one they were Muslim, and that's what I needed to embrace. You know, I couldn't embrace anything else that meant oppression to me. So that was. That's, that's deep, so it's understand where I'm coming from is a, is a message to people, but also an understanding of where I'm coming from. Yeah, yes. At the same time. I just want to latch on to what you were saying. An another factor. Um, do that was also the literature that we've got, you know, because there was a figure known as Kate Channel who used to get information, alternative information from the Universal uh, Zulu Nation, uh, you know, in, in, in New York. Um, and he is one of the figures, uh, you know, that doesn't get mentioned in South Africa anymore. And he's a figure that, you know, shared this, this information with us. Um, furthermore, you also have to understand we also had a nation of Islam. Uh, back in the day of the base and stuff like that. Um, and I mean, me also, not coming from a Muslim household, because I'm still Catholic, I had a still Catholic upbringing, um, I mean, I got influenced by that as well. You know? Yeah, my question's for, for Diana. So, uh, just in the context of Adam mentioning that um, Shahid's dad was, was like a jazz music, um, uh, I'm just wondering 
like how explicit was the connection in, in the 80s and 90s between um, hip hop and jazz and Cape Town? Because, uh, like, on the Cape Flats or whatever, I mean, now you've got guys like Yitzfinger playing you know, Afrikaans, Afrikaans with, with Carl Shepard, and it's like that coming together of the Cape Jazz tradition and hip hop tradition. So, yeah, was it just like the sons and daughters of, of jazz musicians like, taking that sensibility forward into hip hop? Or were there like jams going on with young guys who were playing jazz as well? Or like, what was the vibe? I would say with uh, Shaheen's dad playing a very important role in POC as a producer, that was the first link between jazz and hip hop in our country. And he played on the album. That's great. Yeah, and that was the C on Cape Crusader, one of the coolest Cape Town songs ever. Um, I shall correct you as an avid POC fan. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the first. Oh, uh, Hansen, sorry. <laughs> actually, the first South African hip hop uh, and jazz track was actually on the second PSA album, and the track was called Musical Madness. Oh, yeah. That is actually South Africa's first, you know, jazz meets hip hop for the first time officially. Yeah, I'm gonna have to count for that. <laughs> 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 is is Roots on that album? Was the Roots on the first album? Roots on the first album. Uh, I'm just, the first I'm just gonna tell the story very really, really, really quickly. Um, we, we, we were sitting in the Shaheen's dad's little studio um, producing music, and I always tell the story because I think it's a really phenomenal story, and I'm still trying to make sense of it. Knowing Shaheen's dad and his dad's record collection, but I didn't quite understand jazz music. I heard it in the community, but I didn't understand it. And my motivation for getting involved with Shaheen is I wanted to be a ghetto superstar. When I met him, I heard his dad in the studio and I'm like, dude, uh, when can I record an album? Because I need to make some money, you know. I need cars, I need clothing, I need the whole story. Rappers delight, that for me was, that was the word right there. Uh, Nick's playing basketball and it's color TVs and it's swimming pools. And those things were foreign to us and I'm like, I like what these guys are saying. And the way I'm going to get that is to get into a recording studio and record that stuff. Anyway, we're in the recording studio and I'm checking out Shaheen doing his thing and writing his lyrics and Shaheen's talking to me about Mandela and Biko and what's happening mm -hmm. in school and I'm like, brah, don't talk about those things. Uh, Nick's playing basketball in color TV, let's talk about that. <laughs> you know, that, that's kind of the vibe because I'm in a hurry over, you know, we, we're selling beer bottles and we're selling scrap iron to afford sneakers so that we can style and profile when we go back on the streets because we started off as b-boys. And while sitting in the recording studio one night, uh, Shaheen flipped out his records and on the turntable he drops his vinyl and he drops the needle and there's a jazz song, an Afro jazz song that plays, and it's an Abdullah Ibrahim, better known as Dollar Brand. His song plays the boy. I don't know what happened to me personally. Everything changed. My whole life changed. My perspective, everything changed. And right then, then the lyrics, everything just transformed at that point in time. And that was probably my entry level, once again, into becoming conscious. And it wasn't, the music, the artist, wasn't related to hip hop whatsoever. There was energy, there was a truth, there was a level of persuasion, you know, that changed everything for me. So that was kind of, you know, the first um, connection. And then we wrote a song called Roots Resonated on our first album. That, um, that, that sort of, it's a tribute to Afro jazz, the likes of um, Hotep. Uh, the letter uh, Abdullah Ibrahim, Ravi Jansen, that is some of the, the, the local uh, jazz musicians, and of course, Pacific Express, a band that uh, Shaheen's band belonged to. We were going to run through the entire album with you quickly, but we can't. But can we give you a taste of Cape Crusade at least, at least the introduction? It's okay, I'll go. Because that is the best, and the, the saxophone is the easy. Cape Crusader. Um, I think the saxophonist on that track will stand to be corrected. It could be Robert Jack yeah. Jansen. That we, we sample that track from a Pacific Express album, and the original version was recorded in the early 70s. And the guys didn't write the track, it was a jam session. 
that's what that was all about. And they just decided to record the jam session. And we were listening to some albums for interesting samples to use. And when we latched onto that thing, we didn't have lyrics to the music. The music detected everything. Check it out.
can't you just take the pitch off the wall very quickly and maybe put that pick inside the refrigerator, close the door, just say, shut up, oh boy. And that's exactly what we did. <laughs> this really poppy music video went out and everybody was like, yeah, kicking that stuff, cool, fancy, wow, look at the cool dudes now, you know? And at the end, you see the fridge door open, the picture goes in and boom, the door closes and right then, then that the music video was banned and then <laughs> that portion of the video and on stage that was banned as well, you know, that we got this really hectic letter from the SABC, you know, and from there, one thing led to the another, we recorded the third album, Funk Flow, that didn't get any, sorry, it was um, Age of Truth, and when, after we came from Bukutu Swana, after the story that Shaheen delivered in the clip, I think the whole country was terrified of prophets of the city. They probably thought these guys are gone terrorists, mad, because they're firing shots left, right, and center. And we were scheduled to perform at um, former President Nelson Mandela's inauguration. On the, on the morning of the event, we received a call. You guys can't perform at the event anymore. And our manager fought. We fought. We were threatening with newspaper. Every single channel at our disposal we were going to use to expose these people. Then they decided you guys can perform, but you're not allowed to set up your decks and you can't use your music. And we were like, oh Lord, what are we going to do? We actually had a journalist on um, the source on that page, just follow us um, to cover the story. And then we were like, oh my gosh, but we got Jasmo. Jasmo was one of the members, he was a beatboxer. And we thought, okay, that's the way to go. Jasmo, you beatbox, we we'll run, we're still going to do our things. And that's the way we pulled off that performance at Mandela's inauguration. So that was, you know, just some of the censorship stories from, from our perspective. So even as we're making the transition into the market on Painflow, the fact is, Funflow post election yeah. and then get a code. Definitely post the action. Universal yeah. soldiers as well. Universal soldiers. It was just like it was. It was you know roadblocks all the way. Yeah, and um, understand where I'm coming from. One foreign music, a foreign yeah. music video award. Is it the meeting? Um, yes, the middle. Yeah, and we, we we got exposure, but it was a very small little story in the newspaper and it just came and went that simple and for any artist at that point in time to achieve anything even if you got a gig that was a big thing for South Africans at the time and you know that was just swept under the carpet as well because I think people still felt that threat and we were still seen as a colored group from the Cape Flats and the National Party had a stronghold on the Western Cape so for an outspoken slash militant voice and it's young guys coming from the Cape Flats and the National Party still fighting for votes in the Western Cape it was very dangerous but they would put a lot of groups such as Prophets of the City to become sort of more um, successful or more vocal so that was also part of the reasons I wish you could speak some more but what I want to do is to draw your attention to the present day for those of you that don't know that's Painting got dead, dead money, appeared in the Goodman Gallery just if the morning after I was about to battle a publisher and I was censorship issue in my own book, right? This uh, exhibition went down in Joburg. It's a whole series of critiques and parodies of Zuma, but critiques basically of corruption, nepotism, lack of transparency, consumer culture in the ANC. The spear literally it references the Lenin, the Lenin poster, right? So of course the links the references to communism, the history, the so-called communist history, socialist ideology in place by the ANC completely being flipped over by this neoliberal term, the flaccid penis referencing the rape trial and the remarks that Zuma made during his rape trial, he was acquitted, but the remarks that he made during the rape trial, the sexist remarks. And the assertion that, you know, that is a Zulu traditional male, all of those things being referenced in here, the remarks he made were more damning than the possibility of him being a rapist. He was acquitted. So I think, um, you know, it produced a whole lot of critiques. 
spin off schools. That's my baby. <laughs> so what happens is, you know, in the gallery, the painting gets defaced by two people, unrelated to each other. That's the one thing. But while this is going on, the, you know, court action is launched to sue. Um, but in order to pull this painting and maybe also to, to, to get newspapers to, to stop publishing pictures of the painting, you needed to prove that it was defamation. So it was going to be a long road. First, you have to prove that it's defamation, blah, blah, blah. There's a good defense, there's a public figure, everything that he does, you know, uh, news and critiques. Uh, protected by Section 16 of the Constitution, which guarantees free speech, artists are covered by this, journalists, etc., etc., they probably wouldn't get away. So instead of pursuing that court action, they basically abandoned that and took to the streets, rolling mass action. Let's use 80s and 90s rhetoric. We will march on the gallery, we will pressurize the editor of City Press, she must take this picture down from her website. So this intimidation. Eventually, the editor of City Press, Fido Hafiji, says, you know what, I'm getting intimidated. My journalists now can't work in the field, they can't access trade union meetings because they've been locked out, threatened, etc., etc., for the safety of my staff and just to get everyone to chill the hell out. I'm going to just take the picture down from the website. After the fact, she says, I regret doing that. But at the time, it was really, really difficult. Press meeting, uh, press conference, with, the, with the, the gallery owners um, saying that, you know, uh, basically taking a step back. And it all looks like if they're being muscled to actually, you know, capitulate, right? Um, so it's all very threatening. So even though legal channels weren't used, intimidation was used, right? To actually shut this whole thing down. And I'm thinking to myself, how different is the outcome of you know, the sphere and journalist coverage of the issue, how different is that from the experience of prophets of the city? Right? There are damning parallels, it's really, 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 really tricky. And of course, one of the lightning rods in the, in the, in the media context is someone named Zapiro who has produced a number of critiques. The original critique uh, that he offered was the rank of Lady Justice with members of the Taekwondo Alliance holding Lady Justice down as Jack Zuma um, is about to violate her, right? And, and here we have you know, free speech about to be violated as well. This is his critique of what happened um, you know, during the Spear debacle. But here's the catch. The, Peter, the critique of Spear's critique is that he's banalizing rape, gender-based violence. That gender politics takes the back seat to the politics of the ruling party, that the one is a vehicle for the other. So it's part of these, these replicating the problem here from a gender perspective. So there are all sorts of levels of complexity here that are, that are, that are worth considering. If you want to read up a little bit more about this, <laughs> yes, this was also applied for something that I wrote, um, like yesterday. Send a friend here, check out a book called State of the Nation 2014. The HSRC Press publishes Something called state of the nation on a yearly basis, and it's sort of like, you know, a thermometer. How's the country doing on a range of areas? So there's an article about this very issue in State of the Nation 2014, also in, I think, the first chapter, 3,000 words in the first chapter of the book Static, also discusses this. It's worth looking at, especially in relation to the story of censorship. Thank you so much.